I wrote something for Frank. And I said, if anything, if a piece of hair is missing off his head, you better go and find it and put it back on. Because when he comes out, if there's any hair missing, we're going to make a claim for that for that hair. So I, I guess they're just looking at it as, yeah, right, what can you do about it? Are you an attorney? It's like, mm, no. Uh, you know, an attorney would have to petition a judge. And an attorney would never even waste his time petitioning a judge and saying, look, you got to go after the county facilities, you got to go out to the detention center, you got to go over to these private organizations, and the judge would say, really, I'm going to sue the local detention center. I'm going to help you beat the county jail. I'm going to help you beat these people, really. Um, the only problem with that is my pension check is attached to that detention center. The money, if the detention center makes money, our, our pension checks will go up. If the detention centers don't make money, we're investing our pension funds into these privately held detention centers. So why would I want to help an attorney, if I'm a judge, why would I want to help an attorney sue a detention center where my pension funds are being funneled into and we're trying to make thrive and we're trying to have these detention centers grow and we're trying to get more and more prisoners so we can make more and more dividends on into our pension fund. We can get more, uh, you know, so when we retire, our pension you know, fund will be massive. Because, see, they get to control who goes into those detention centers, the judges. So, obviously, if they say, hey, you know what, we need 5,000 more people here, you know, in the state level, the state judges are like, damn, how are we going to fill that, how are we going to meet the quarter? How are we going to do this? So, they're going to just start, well, let's look on people's internet. Let, let's let's look inside of people's computers and see if we can find a dirty picture. And that way, we charge the guy with a felony and throw him, in a, throw him inside of a detention center until at least the first of the year. So, at least that way, we get... Um, we got the quarter up. We, we, you know, we finished a year with, you know, you know, 5,001 inmates. We just got to round up another 5,000 real quick and just so we get, a, you know, matching state and federal funds for uh, pension centers. So, like I said, it's going to have to be somebody from the outside like me who has absolutely no, you know, concern whether or not this prison facility is detention center, these privately held, traded up detention centers, uh, make a profit or not this year. I couldn't care less. You know, it's like this man's been harmed, and you will compensate it. This man's been harmed, and we're going to uh, make a claim through their insurance, through whoever they identify them, whether it's uh, an escrow account or a bond or an insurance policy. However, they're identified, I guarantee they can't open those doors and put one man into that facility unless they're identified. So, whoever their identifier is, you know, I told my little sister Mary, go find out who their identifier is. I said, start, uh, I can almost guarantee most of the corporations like that, that size would go to the travelers group up there in Hartford, Connecticut. But I'm not saying, I'm just saying that's what happened in Alabama. I don't know who or what identifies these folks down here in Virginia. I said, but you're going to have to get online and find out. I told her about uh, down in Bradstreet, Street, you know, whatever it was. I told her to go, you know, build a little account if, you, if they need, uh, if you need a little bit of money, you know, to uh, open up the account, let me know. And I'll open up an account so I could do some research to find out uh, exactly who um, or what is the indemnifier of uh, that local detention center. I guarantee their information will be on there somewhere. And, um, oh, that's what I was saying about Frank. I videotaped me going in there and talking to the nurse. One of the first days he was there. And she just laughed. And she said, it's not going to get half of this. I said, ma'am, that's fine. If that's what you believe, if you believe that what this doctor wrote for him and what this doctor said that he requires for him to be healthy, if you don't believe what the doctor prescribed, that's fine. If you're not going to give him what the doctor prescribed, do as you wish. I said, but I'm telling you, if there's one hand missing on his head, you better go find it now. I said, because if you don't find it when he leaves, I said, I'm going to make a claim for that return of that piece of hair. So she said, well, I'll bring it back to the doctor and see what he can do. I said, ma'am, ma'am. I said, look, I don't know if you know what I do for a living. And then I just showed at the beginning of the English show that I do. I said, but uh, I help people make comp get compensation for when uh, the government or an employee or a man or a woman of the government or uh, any public servant causes harm to their fellow man, you know, due to negligence. I said, uh, you, you know, I usually don't go for a deliberate want and intent, but um, there's no doubt about it that now you know what he requires to be healthy, and now it's up to you to do as you wish. She was like, well, I'll, I'll get it back to the doctor and see what he'll do. I said, ma'am, watch my lips. Do as you wish. Whether you bring it to the doctor or not is no longer any of my concern. I just gave you the message, and I told you what the doctor requires for this man. If you don't do it, don't. 
do as you wish. So like I said, that was a great uh, little you know, one, two-minute uh, video. So let me see if I can get this man in Tennessee. And, but like I said, um, yeah, Frank lost his sight out of his left eye while he was there now. And um, Frank was trying to tell them, I can't, I'm starting to lose my sight, and I have to get a needle in his eye. I don't know if the needle had to be put in his eye to relieve the pressure or what. The doctor actually called the hospital, uh, called the jail, called the detention center, uh, faxed the detention center, said Frank has got to be, you know, brought to this office immediately. And they ignored it. And then the doctor said, okay, you know what, I'll, I'll pack up this contraption. I'll bring it down to the jail. You have Frank meet, you know, put Frank in some sort of room, and I'll put him in this contraption, and I'll do the procedure there. And they said no. So thank God they got all this proof. Well, I got all this proof now, too, that they said no that they weren't going to allow that to happen. So this magical unicorn fucking day is going to have a name. He's going to be a CEO. He's going to be something. But the bottom line is he's going to be indemnified. So whoever the, you know, indemnifier is, that's who you uh, just make a simple um, call, phone call and just say, hey, do you got a website, you know, like a, a way that I could just follow, file a simple form for your company, just a simple claim for damages? Is, is there a simple form I could find online? They're like, well, yes, sir, and I'll tell you that you can look for our claim damage in this. Okay. So the way I done in Bradstreet, and I found out, uh, you know, is this the correct policy number for this organization? Oh, yes, that's the correct you know, policy number for this organization. Thank you. So that way when I uh, put down the, uh, the cl- and file a claim form, you folks don't have to, like, look for the policy number. Uh, you know, it's nice to already have it, to put it right on the form. So it just makes it seem appear that you're competent, that you, you have kind of a clue what's going on, and you're just like whining and bitching, that you actually have a, a kind of sense of what's going on and how actually you know, all this stuff proceeds. Like I said, I'm going to basically do factual innocence. Obviously, I'm going to say it's factual innocence, but I'm basically going to tell them, look, a piece of the facts. To move this, it's just like O.J. Simpson you guys could have done that with him. It could have been factual innocence. See, they could have done the same thing. They do so what Marshall Clark was trying to accomplish and the county of Los Angeles was trying to accomplish. Actually, it has to be based on these facts. Facts one, you know, it must have this. Facts two, there must be a witness. Facts three, there must be a weapon. Facts, you know, four, there must be, a, you know, the body. You know, facts one, there must have been motive. So, yes, they had the motive and they had the body, but they had no third-hand impartial witness and they had no weapon. So... Honestly, O.J. should have walked, but since O.J. had $14 million, his team, team attorneys want to make sure they tap all $14 million out of O.J.'s extensions account when they could have, O.J. just could have called me. And uh, just like with almost everybody I deal with, I just do a factual innocence, type a notice to the court. I don't actually call it factual innocence because that's a legal term, but I compare it to factual innocence. And uh, they just realized, uh, well, um, yeah, now that you brought that up, yeah, honestly, um, yeah, honestly, uh, we'll uh, hold the trial in uh, six months from now, a year or two from now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll uh, postpone this. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you fucking will. Yeah, the only problem is honey uh, cakes is uh, um, while you were doing your case against this man or this woman, I filed a case against you folks. It is just luckily it's going to coincide next week. You know, we're going to move my claim in the court at the same time you guys move yours. So you better move your damn case into that court. You better open it, and you better, uh, w- you know, move your case. You told us it's next Tuesday. Damn it, it better be next Tuesday. I ain't coming back. So sorry, Bali. Bali was supposed to get his old case into that court three weeks before Rob. We did it. We did it on a day of the freaking trial, which is on Saturday. If the guy ever knew the damn rules, he would have been able to say, look, you know, you can't ambush me with a claim. You got, you can't do this. You got to give me time to read the claim, study it. You got to give me time to answer. You got to give me time to get witnesses. You got to give me time to check your facts. Blah blah blah. But thank God the guy was so freaking arrogant. He was like, "What's this crap? What's this dribble?" And he just threw it away. I said, "Oh, thank God! Thank God he thinks I'm a joke." Oh, sweet Jesus! Thank God. There's no clue what's about to happen. <laughs> so I love their arrogance. I love their attitude. I, I love it. Because it, it makes my my job so much easier. Then if you knew the damn bloody rules, because I actually told them that when it was over, you know, when I went to talk to the prosecutors of the Crown, I said, "Look, let me give you a hint. What I just did was an ambush." I said, "How to prevent an ambush next time?" I said, "I'll toss you this little hint: is that uh, you have to have time to study the claim, and you have time to answer the claim." I said, uh, 
But so next time somebody drops one of these in your lap, you take it at trial, just ask court for leave of court until you can answer the claim in the proper manner. Okay? You know, that's all you had to do. I said, that's the only hint I'm going to give you. He said, there's probably about 105 hints I could give you how you could have stopped me. But how about I just drop you that little nugget? He said, you know, like, well, there is no common law. Yeah, 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 really. Okay, well, the judge said now for the common law side of the case. And I explained to you, there must be common law somewhere in England, whether you believe it or not. It might not exist in your world, which I'm sure it does not. It sure does exist in mine. You know, I appeared in court as man, so it exists in my world. You know what also exists in my world? Unicorns, leprechauns, four-leaf clovers, anything I wish to manifest into reality is reality. Man is not limited in his capacity, any capacity, to do as he wishes. Believe whatever he wishes. So, have a nice day, sir. You know, but I love it. People look at me like, call you crazy. Yeah, crazy like a fox. Yeah, it's crazy. Good crazy. At least a crazy had to be bad. Like I said, the people who listen to me, and the one guy, yes, I wasn't specifically talking about you last night. I forgot what his name is. It's a long name. You know, Stepopopoulos, whatever his name is. I don't know. He says he listens to my show while he's working on the roof all day. He does some sort of roofing for a living. And uh, I said, yeah, you folks are funny. You guys call me up. And he said, I've been listening to you for six months, two, three years, whatever. I say, you know, thank you for all your help. And he said, but they've never donated to me a dime. And then I said, well, I need you to help me now, and I'll give you some money now because now I need your help. I said, wait a second, wait a second. Can you just say I helped you all these years? And uh, like I said, you know, I, I got to understand because most people might think like uh, they hear radio hosts on the shows, you know, doing like Rush Limbaugh or somebody like Sean Hannity. Sean Hannity's not asking for donations because he actually gets paid by, you know, you know whatever communication network he works for. And uh, he gets paid whatever millions of dollars a year to spit out what he spits. So when people are saying, Call, why are you only doing your shows now? And you're um, basically not answering questions from people anymore. It's like because I realize people are at, um, they're, they're asking me questions for five freaking hours. And if, if the show would go for six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen hours, people would expect me to keep answering these damn questions. And I get about $100 a week in donations. And uh, it's just not cutting it. It just doesn't make any sense why I should uh, devote so much time to helping people when people won't help me in return. And then I say to people anyway, look, if you don't know the right thing to do is to, uh, you know, uh, help somebody who's helping you, what makes you think you're going to carry this off in court? It's a lifestyle. It's like I said, uh, I don't know if I said it in the show is recording or not, but, you know, like I said, it's like you're know, even feeding like this dog. And my sister's got an old dog she left behind because she can't keep it in New York, so she brought it here. And it's like 13, 14, 15. It's old, you know, gray, white dog. And when I got here, you know, whatever, three, four, five months ago, the dog was shaking like a leaf. My brother asked me, he said, hey, why is this dog shaking? I said, he's starving. I said, uh, he, he doesn't have enough muscles. I'm telling him muscle strength to support his legs. And you're not feeding him. And he said, oh, yeah, we are. I said, no, 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 you're feeding him corn. He said, the only thing he's going to get out of that is diabetes. He, he, the dog doesn't eat corn. Like yesterday, I uh, I made noodles when I was here, so I gave him some noodles. I put some ham in it and some turkey and uh, a couple of eggs, some milk and uh, butter and uh, cooking oil. And uh, when I walked down to my place last night, I dropped it off him. And obviously, he's not shaking anymore because I'm feeding him real freaking food. And this is what I tell people. I say, look, that dog really doesn't, he doesn't, obviously, he doesn't belong to me. He's not my freaking dog. But I see something and it needs help. And I go help it because it's a lifestyle. It's a style. It's not, you got to do it because somebody's paying me to take care of that fucking dog. That dog drops down and dies. The only thing they're going to ask me to do is take up my back hole, dig a hole and drop the dog in a, in a hole. And everybody's going to go on with their freaking day. You're just going to be like, oh, well. It's like throwing a piece of toilet paper, not a you know, toilet bowl to them. It's like, oh, well, he's gone. So what? But uh, while he's here, there's a quality of life that I try to uh, maintain. There's a quality of life that I try to maintain for these animals. And anybody who's ever lived with me or seen me, they see that I give the food. Like Gus has lived with me for like seven weeks. I guarantee Gus see me feed those animals damn good food. He didn't see me just, you know, toss them the oh, look, look, there's a sale. Now, a bag of cat food, 100 pounds for a dollar. Oh, man, this stuff's great. Let me, oh, wow, I don't have to pay no money. No, I'm sure he's seen me tossing all kinds of meat. I had three or four freezers full of meat. If I have meat, they eat meat. You know, it's just, it's, it's a style. So all you people who are trying to master what I'm doing, you are going to fail miserably. You're wasting your effing time listening to me and listening to my shows, you're wasting your time until you make it a lifestyle. People are looking for like this quick little, uh, 
what are these guys called? This is like a Mark Stevens kind of thing, a form. Just fill out this form. Here's my 500-page package that you can get for $100. Drop it in a court's lap, and you won't have to pay a $25 parking ticket. Just donate to me $200, and I'll mail you this 500 pages worth of crap. Then he'll say, look, we got another victory, another $25 parking ticket. It wasn't paid. It didn't have to be paid. And all this guy to do is pay me 200 to give this 500 fucking page package because the prosecutors are looking at the 500 pages and say, oh, this is ridiculous. We're not dealing with this guy. We ain't tying up the courthouse for two, three days for the $25 part. We ain't dealing with doing this. So like I said, I could do it in by, you know, two, three sentences. I'm done. I don't have to spend $500. I don't have to spend $200 to, to do it. But like I said, it's how are you going to carry it off? How are you going to pull it off? It's a style. It's a it's a rhythm. It's a pattern. It's a swagger. It's a it's a tone. It's a it's a it's a cadence. It's a rhythm. It's it's a lifestyle. You know, it's it's and then if the judge tries you and he and he tries to put you back on your heels and he tries to see if you're for real, will you be able to carry the day or not? And that's the example I gave yesterday. When some uh, court reporter lady, she kept standing up and I kept standing up and she'd walk out of the room and I'd walk out of the room. You know, judge get up and down. You know, he'd get up and down. I wasn't getting up and down for him. That lady got up. I got up and down. Because it's a style. It's a belief. You could say it's chauvinistic and it's, you know, old-fashioned and, you know, it's hundreds of thousands of years old. And we don't do that anymore. But I still do. Why? Because it's a lifestyle. It's a style. It's a belief. You know, it's just like uh, when we were walking in England, you know, the Punjabi people, well, we were walking down the sidewalk. And it was funny. I stopped and everybody keep walking. And then I'd be, I'd see the Punjabi men who were up in the front talking to each other, and they would like look around, looking for call. Like, where's call? And I was behind everybody, so they they'd stand still and wait for the women to walk past them, and then, uh, they, you know, I'd catch up to them, and we'd start walking again, and then the women would start falling behind again, and then I'd fall behind the women again. And what was funny is, uh, I said to these guys, I said, look, I know you guys want to talk to me. I know all you men want to talk to me. I said the only problem is. Nobody's got the rear. Who's got the rear? I said, the women are straggling behind. They're falling behind. Who's got the rear? Nobody. Why don't one of you men walk in the rear? And he said, well, the women walk in the rear. I said, do you understand that's why the English conquer you people all the time? Because of your damn arrogance and your damn pride, and you don't have any kind of like military tactics. You guys just believe like you're all going to run in like gung-ho and prove your manhood by just attacking like a forward a frontal attack and nobody's got the rear. I said, do you understand how easy it is to pick you guys off one at a time from behind? Take your women, take your children, then what do you got? Who's going to supply you food? Who's going to supply you, you know, the the, the rations? Who's going to supply you with clothing? We're going to take you from behind. You know, I said, because you guys got too much pride. I said, that's why the, the English kick your ass every time you guys fight. I said, because you guys got too much pride. You think you're a man because you're in the front. I said, but who's protecting the rear? I said, somebody's going to have to stay behind the rear so we could pay attention to what's going on, you know, so the women are safe. And like I said, it's just a style. And it's, like I said, you could say it's Germanic. You could say it's because I'm Bavarian. You could say I'm German. You could say it's because my dad told me that's how he was taught by his dad, who was taught by his dad, and not a freaking bloody male lens ever could read and write, you know, a piece of paper. You know, my dad couldn't read. His dad couldn't read. I'm sure his dad dad couldn't read. You know, but we all knew what to do. We all knew how to survive. How to survive living in a in a forest, how to survive. You know, somebody's gonna have to stand behind. Because my dad said that when he was up in the cabins when he was a kid. He said he used to hide out in upstate New York instead of going into the forced not forced the kid back then they had um reform schools back then. And uh he said he'd run away from the reform schools and go upstate and that's where the the county guys found him in one of their, like, you know, like Goldilocks and Three Bears scene, you know. He was hiding out in somebody's cabin, and uh, it was an Italian family. They had, like, Italians and Jews that have all those cabins. And uh, what was funny is um, he said he was watching the hunters hunt deer, and he said he he was up on the top of the mountains. He said it was so funny. He said to me, all these hunters would come from, like, New York City, and they'd be walking around the valley. And he said it was funny watching all the deer follow all the hunters. So while the deer, <laughs> when the hunters started walking again, the deer would start walking, and they were following the hunters. My dad said all the hunters had to do was turn around and walk like two, three hundred yards behind them, and all the deer were just standing there, waiting for the hunters, following the hunters. 
So see, something like that stuck in my head when I was a little kid. My dad didn't go hunting. He thought it was just cruel. He said, there's no reason to. He said, there's plenty of meat available. To, you know, my dad was a butcher. My dad's dad was a butcher. And, uh, you know, that's when my grandfather came here to the United States. That's why he made so much money when he went back to Germany. He During ra- times of rationing, you know, the guy who bakes bread and controls the rubber ties and the gasoline and the meat supply, and those kind of guys like uh, Howard Hughes, is going to make billions of dollars. You know, during time of uh, rationing, during time of, uh, you know, scarcity, those guys are going to make a fortune. My grandfather made a fortune as a butcher during times of rationing. So um, what's funny is, like I said, my dad, just that my dad telling me that story, like I said, I guess that's why I'm such a, you know, that's why I know as much as I do. It's because I was the the kid that, you know, when people later said the guy's grandfather down the street, he was deaf, but he would tell stories the best he could. And I remember his grandkids coming up to him when the ice cream man came around and said, my grandpa, they point to his ears, like, they point towards the truck, like, ice cream, ice cream, and they'd get some money from the old man, and they'd run to the truck, but they wouldn't listen to the old man's story. So I listened to the old man's stories about um, how he worked up in the sand pits and the salt that they would pull out of it up there in Long Island, and where uh, New York City had, like, 7 million people that's where they bury all the bodies, where all the poor people, the people who didn't have family to actually uh, and turn them into a cemetery or grave or a mausoleum. You know, he was explaining how they would just stack them, you know, dozens and dozens of bodies every day, you know, who nobody came and made a claim for. The family's just going to afford to bury them in a proper way. So, uh, you know, it's just stories from listening to older people, you know, and what they've lived through since I've been a child. Well, it allowed me to uh, put this into practice in later life. So it's very important for the older people to pass down their stories to the younger people. So I understand why they're trying to do something like that to, like, dads. They're trying to get the dads out of the children's lives or get the dads so consumed with trying to make child support payments or the dads so trying to get a, keep up with the Joneses and have the, the woman lead the man and say, look, we've got to get a bigger house. We Now we got an extra $1,000 a month coming in. we got to sell this old house and buy a bigger one. But well, now that we got an extra five hundred dollars a month, we got to get rid of this old car and buy a big SUV. So the guys aren't saying no. We're going to stick with what we got. It works. And uh, no, just because we made a little bit extra, no, we're going to save it and we're going to, uh, you know, get ready for a rainy day. That's why everybody says people nowadays have a uh, uh, one paycheck, two paychecks away from being thrown out of their homes because people are forgetting the old values in the um, you know, storing, you know, for the for the hard times. People go through no hard times anymore. We get a massive snowstorm. Okay, we get a hot, hot day for what three, or four days. We're without. And everybody panics like it's the end of the world. Well, you know, you know, hundred years ago when it snowed in October, there was no more food to be found until June. So somehow we had to all save up and survive somehow. Especially like you could say people in the northern hemisphere, like in Germany or something, they had to make sure there was you know five, six, seven months worth of food stored. Well, they weren't going to make it. The family was going to die. Everybody was going to die. So we, I come from a very practical type of people that we couldn't just throw a net out to the Mediterranean Sea and go catch a shitload of fish every day. So we had to we had to understand this concept of survival and what it took to survive. There's practical skills. So like I said, while I'm dealing with court, it's the same thing with me. It's survival skills. You know, it's, it's not going to, you know, you, you have to practice and you have to store up and you have to get ready. And that's what I'm trying to say. It's not just you're just going to go out there and you're going to throw that line into the court and like I'm going to walk away the champion. Yeah, you might. You might get lucky. You might drop, knock the judge off, kilt him a little bit. He'll say, holy shit, um, what do I do? Or you get a judge like me. Oh, you pull that stunt on me. Oh, you bet I'm going, to, I'm going to work you and I'm going to work you. Just like that one judge did to me. He worked me for seven hours. I stood there for seven hours. 9 o'clock in the morning to about 4.30 in the afternoon, and then the courthouse was closing up, and he said, okay, call, that's enough. We didn't stop for lunch. We didn't go to the bathroom. We didn't do anything. I stood there, and I talked from 9 o'clock until about 4.30. He tried me. Man, he tried every move in the book to try to get me to, to move off my standing, move my status, and I wasn't budging. Not an inch. 